Hello, this is the first in the series on space and in this video we're going to be looking at the constituents of the solar system and the major constituents of the universe and then we're going to be looking at the life cycles of stars. Okay, so here is a graphic of the solar system containing all the major parts. Obviously at the center we have the Sun. Now the Sun makes up something like 99.3% of all the mass in the solar system. It's quite a large object and very important and it's the powerhouse of the solar system and everything else revolves around the Sun. Um, here we have the four inner planets all right, and their associated moons. Um, nearly all the planets have moons. I think Mercury is the only one without any moons. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. They're small and they're rocky and they're all reasonably close to uh, the Sun. Uh, roughly equal distances apart, but quite close, very, very close compared to these big ones out here. Um, in between the inner planets and the outer planets, separating them, if you like, is the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt is made up of millions of rocks, from those the size of your fingernail to almost moon-sized rocks. Ceres is one of the largest of the asteroids um, and sits there in this orbit in between Mars and Jupiter. In fact, if it weren't for Jupiter, the asteroid belt may have been able to form another planet. But because of Jupiter's very large gravitational pull, um, it hasn't. It's remained in bits, effectively, in little, little rocks. So then we come to the giant outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Um, they are what we call gas giants. And they're made of predominantly simple gases like hydrogen, helium, methane, things like that. Um, they have no specific core, really. No, that, that it's suggested that, that they may have a small rocky core, uh, but they're made predominantly of, of those simple gases. Jupiter and Saturn have many, many, many moons, 50 or 60 moons each, uh, and still counting. Uranus and Neptune also have um, a large series of moons that, um, that orbit them as well. In fact, some of the moons uh, of Saturn and Jupiter are larger than, than Mercury. So there we are. Uh, Saturn is the one with a big ring system, but um, Uranus and Neptune also have much fainter ring systems as well. Jupiter and Saturn can be seen with a naked eye. Uh, in fact, um, Saturn is the furthest object in the solar system that can be seen with a naked eye. Uranus was discovered in the 18th century by um, William Herschel. Um, okay, so those are the outer planets, enormous gas giants, and this, this diagram really isn't to scale. These are separated by absolutely enormous distances. Then outside of that we have uh, the Kuiper Belt. Now the Kuiper Belt is a bit like the asteroid belt, only larger and further away. There are millions upon millions upon millions of Kuiper Belt objects. Um, out there and that's where most of the comets come from. And there are also many dwarf planets of which Pluto is the most famous. Now Pluto obviously was a planet as I'm sure you, you knew. It was classified as a planet until recently when they decided that it didn't have the necessary characteristics to be called a planet and so they kind of downgraded it to uh, dwarf planet status. But there are many other dwarf planets, and some uh, are given here. Some of them are what we call trans-Neptunian objects, like Pluto, um, which cross over Neptune's orbit and back again as they orbit around the Sun. Um, but many of them also come from the Kuiper Belt. Uh, so there are many here, and some of these are some of the larger Kuiper Belt objects. And then we have a few random bits of rock, uh, quite large pieces of rock beyond the Kuiper Belt, uh, things like Sedna, which used to be called Planet X, I believe, um, and Eris and things like that. And then we also have the comets. Now, comets have massively elliptical orbits, so they will swing from the Kuiper Belt or beyond in towards the Sun. They go around the Sun in a tight orbit as they speed up, and then they come back out uh, towards the edge of the solar system as they slow down. Highly elliptical orbit. The tail of a comet always faces away from the sun. So if there was a comet on this particular trajectory around our sun here, when it, when it was at this point here, the, the tail would point out in this direction. By the time it got around to here, the tail would point in this direction, away from the sun. And it's the solar wind that drives the tail in that particular direction. Um, the, uh, the radiation from the sun heats up the comet, vaporizes some of the... Uh, 
the, 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 the compounds, uh, the chemicals on its surface, such as water and other, other ices like that. Um, and then the solar wind, which is charged particles from the sun, pushes those vaporized um, molecules away from the, the comet. Okay, so that's kind of the main bits of the solar system. Um, there are four inner planets and four outer planets, so you've got that symmetry there. These are all small and rocky and reasonably hot. Uh, these are all extremely large, made of gas and reasonably cold. You know, we're talking about minus 200 degrees or thereabouts on average. So that's that. So let's zoom out a little bit and have a look at the main constituents of the universe itself. So one of the main things that makes up the universe is stars. Now stars are mostly made of hydrogen uh, and also to a limited extent helium. So hydrogen and helium are the two most abundant objects, uh, most abundant um, elements in, this, in the universe uh, made during the Big Bang, formed during the Big Bang or just after the Big Bang when the universe was beginning to cool down uh, and stars are made up of the majority of that now. You've also got the interstellar medium which is the space in between stars um, that's not empty, of course, that's made up of very sort of uh, diffuse clouds of dust and gas and things like that. So stars make up um, a large proportion of the mass uh, balance in the universe. Then we've got radiation. Radiation forms a large part of the sort of mass energy balance of the universe, if you like. This is more energy we're talking about rather than matter now. And there are two main types of radiation. There's what we call stellar radiation, which comes from stars. Stars obviously radiate quite a lot of radiation. But there's also cosmic radiation. Um, and cosmic radiation can be the leftover energy from the Big Bang, for example, um, or other things like that. Let's just tidy that up a little bit. There you go, cosmic radiation. Okay. Um, then we've got galaxies. Now, a galaxy is just a large conglomeration or an aggregation, collection, if you like, of stars. Um, orbiting around um, a common center. So in the center of large galaxies we think is a, a supermassive black hole, a black hole with a mass of many many millions of stars um, and around and that kind of forms the powerhouse, the gravitational center of the galaxy and in each of these spiral arms there will be millions upon millions of, of stars uh, and if this were the Milky Way looking in at our own galaxy you know, our sun will be somewhere out here, just one of these stars on one of these bright arms. So that's a galaxy. Now there's something like a hundred billion, so what's that? That's 10 to the 11 uh, stars in, in a large galaxy such as our own. Um, and when you consider that there are billions and billions and billions of galaxies in our universe, then, you know, that's a lot of matter, a lot of stars. But it accounts for only about 4% of the matter. Um, in uh, in the universe. The rest is what we call dark matter. Now we don't actually know very much about dark matter but we can we can guess that it that it is there. We can we can su su surmise its existence. Um, galaxies don't spin at the rate that they should do if the stars in them was all there was. So there must be something else um, and now you can't see this diagram very well, but here in the middle here, this little blue band here is a galaxy, um, gal or rather a galactic center, and the brown patch around there is the, uh, the sort of boundary of, of the galaxy. So that's all the matter, the visible matter, or what we call the luminous matter, made of stars in that galaxy. And around it, we think, is a very, very large halo of dark matter. Um, now, dark matter is called dark matter because it doesn't interact with uh, electromagnetic radiation, so we can't see it. But the way that the galaxy spins suggests that there's a lot of it out there, um, and something like 25% of uh, of the matter energy balance, if you like, in the universe is dark matter. The rest of it is made up of dark energy, which is way beyond the specifications of the A level. But please do look it up if you're interested. Okay, so that's pretty much what's in the universe. Okay, so now we're going to look at the life cycles of stars. Um, stars have, uh, have lives just like people and they have different phases in their lives um, and they follow a reasonably common evolutionary path until towards the end. 
And so we're going to look at the different evolutionary endpoints as well as the entire life of a star. So here's one, um, a, a sort of timeline for our star, the Sun. From its birth, it's been stable for about four and a half billion years. This, this timeline here is in billions of years. So we're now here. This is where the Sun is uh, with us orbiting around it. And we think it will stay that way for another four billion years or so until it starts to become unstable at around nine billion years. Um, and when it does that, it'll swell to become uh, what we call a red giant. You know, it will become extremely large in comparison to where it is at the moment. And there will be different processes going on inside it, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then it will get rid of its outer layers. All the hydrogen envelope around the outside will be cast off into space, revealing the hot core of the red giant, which is what we call a white dwarf. Um, the outer layers um, become what we call a planetary nebula, although it's got nothing to do with planets, which is, it can be very beautiful around the outside. Uh, the white dwarf will then, it's very, very hot because it's the core of a star, and over billions upon billions upon billions of years, it will fade as it cools. So that's kind of uh, what's going to happen to to the star. So it's going to be quite an exciting stage in about five billion years' time, but I don't think we'll be around to see it. <laughs> or oh, we won't, anyway. 